Hello and welcome. This is George Kerr. Today we are talking with the West Cornwall artist Jeremy Le Grice, whose exhibition Boats has just closed to much acclaim at Badcock's Gallery. Now, Jeremy, your family links with Newling go back a very, very long way. I believe you saw Peter Lanyon's exhibition Harvest Festival here in Newling back in 1953, and it was at that that you found a great inspiration and you actually went on to, I believe, study with Peter Lanyon. Can you tell us what you found stimulating in Peter Lanyon's work? I was very lucky because I went to his first summer school by a very lucky chance that my aunt, Treve, had known his sister Mary Schofield Godolphin, who was a very close friend, and she took me across to see Peter Lanyon in St. Ives, and he was looking for students. The unbelievable thing is, you know, now he's become such a myth, but in 1955, I think this was, he'd advertised in all the arts magazines, finding it very hard to collect six, ten students, and eventually there were six of us, four wonderful females, one from Sweden, one from South America, and an English teacher, and I, Antonio Malley, who turned up from, from Dublin. And Peter Lanyon was throwing all his very considerable creative energies into teaching, at the St. Peter's Loft, which was the long room above the present Penwith Gallery in St. Ives. And it was the most stimulating summer a 17-year-old boy, I just left school, had, uh, you know, the most stimulating time one could ever imagine. And he taught a lot to do with the craft of painting. He was very passionate about drawing. We did drawings from models. He took us out into the landscape and talked while we painted. And it just couldn't have been a better summer. I understand that one of uh, Peter Lanyon's interests was actually in, in industry of various kinds. I noticed that he actually did tackle the theme of boats himself. Is, is that right? He painted very beautifully, particularly early on, and he was very passionate about Cornish industry, which he identified chiefly as the sort of tin and copper mining. And he and Pat Heron were always quite intense rivals. Ostensibly, they were friends, but in fact, they were very keen rivals. And Pat Heron had just brought the eagle's nest up above Zena, and there was a talk of some tin mining happening just below it. And Lanyon was extremely actively encouraging that um, application, while Pat Heron was extremely keenly trying to block it. And it was a, quite a war of the titans. There must have been some fascinating discussions in those days. I mean, I actually grew up in St. Ives at the same time and was a a boy, and I remember Terry Frost quite well because I used to play with Tony um, and uh, his brother, uh, Adrian Frost. Can you tell us a bit more about the atmosphere of that and, and the various ages of people at that time? Very much. It, it was a most extraordinary chance being at this summer school because it was a very sociable atmosphere amongst the artists there, not only meeting at the pubs in the evening and the day, but also parties. And I remember particularly the first major party I went to was on Porth Whidden Beach. I think it was Dennis Mitchell's birthday. And there were the whole lot of artists and some behaving in an extremely bohemian manner and very enthralling indeed for a boy of 17. Yes, I always remember Dennis at school, actually, because he taught art with um, Charlie McCarthy at the time, and he always used to come in wearing a corduroy jacket and sandals without um, any socks and things, and that was always quite unusual to us boys at Humphrey Davy. I was going to say that in 1955, Brian Winter brought Carl Veschke to St. Ives. I've just been reading a little bit about him and how he, he influenced your palette, I believe, and... Uh, can you tell us about him? Because he sounds a fascinating uh, personality. 
I think Carl did more than influence my palate. That same year, or perhaps the year later, I got a painting accepted at the Penrith Society, which was then a very important exhibition with Nicholson and Hepworth and people exhibiting. And Carl came up to me at the private view and said that he really liked my picture and he'd like to see more of my work. And as a very ardent, keen 17 or 18 year old, my uncle at Treve, who was incredibly hospitable and kind to me, used to lend me the farm Land Rover every Sunday, where I used to mainly drive across to the north coast. So Carl was living over at Tregarthen, just below the Eagle's Nest, Tregarthen Cottage, where Lawrence, in fact, had lived in the First World War with Frieda. And I loaded up my paintings the morning after, <laughs> it's embarrassing to think of, the morning after this private view, and arrived at Carl's uh, cottage down there, where he, was, he appeared from a bedroom window looking very sleepy with a girl in the background, and said, what on earth are you doing? And I said, you wanted to see my picture. Anyway, after that rather sort of faulty start, we became very intense fri fr friends for 30 years or more because, in fact, it so happened that Carl bought a, a cottage down at Rushton at Cape Cornwall, uh, unbeknown to me, when Mary, my first wife and I, bought um, the house in 24 Chapel Street in St. Just, where we lived through the 60s and into the 70s. And we bought this, as Carl did, in the latter part of 1960. And the result was that either at our house or at Carl's house, Carl and we saw each other well nigh every day. And he was a wonderful mentor and a great man with anecdotes. I understand that, that Veshka was um, influenced very much by writers. Um, W.S. Graham, and there was someone else, I can't quite remember no, who. But Sidney, um, Sidney Graham was a, a great friend of both Carl and, well, us, and uh, of um, Roger Hilton particularly. And Sidney was living in a cottage with his wife Nessie on the sea's edge behind the Gunners Head pub. And he was leading um, really no money. I mean, there's a sort of romantic stories about poets living on nothing, but he really had no money at all. And I think he was writing beautifully at that time. And he used to congregate, with, particularly with Brown, Winter, Pat Heron, well, the whole lot of painters, actually. In the 50s and 60s, I believe you served with a committee at New Lynn. What were sort of issues were coming up at that time? And... What was the atmosphere in the New Lynn uh, society like? Well, it's very interesting how all these things go around, and it gives one a very long perspective, because, in fact, Lanyon, as you probably know, um, split with the Penwith Society in the mid-50s, and he transferred his power base to New Lynn, which, of course, is a wonderful gallery. And it had ha had its um, society... New Lynn Society of Artists, which had been formed in 1895 and was at that time a very traditional gang of painters who were still painting in what is now regarded as the old New Lynn style of painting. And Lanyon got some of his acolytes, including me, to join him on the committee. And we, with appalling relish, as one does at that age, of immaturity, took great delight in slinging off very good paintings by Dodd Proctor, Dennis Law, uh, um, and not, I think, Alistair uh, Garson, because she was a, a different type of painter. But a lot of the traditional paintings got absolutely mercilessly slung off. And it's very odd how a different version of this circumstance has come round in the present. It's very interesting. You actually then uh, moved off to Gloucestershire, was that right? And I was wondering what sort of painting you were doing at that time. Um, not boats, I imagine, but landscape. When I was living at St. Just from 1960 to 1970, broadly speaking, I wasn't really painting boats at all. I was painting 
the landscape and the cliffs and to some extent the sea. And then my first marriage ended in 1969 because my first wife Mary, who had been a student with me at the Slade, suddenly, well, suddenly she'd been a very um, conscientious and good mother to our three children. And then as they grew up a bit, she felt she needed to be a painter and she found she couldn't paint alongside me and it's absolutely true it's fatal for well I in, in my experience I've seen so many couples who are both painters and there's a su submerged rivalry which of course is hopeless anyway we split up and we remained very very good friends until she very sadly died this last year and anyway I was painting the landscape and then after my marriage split up, I saw a Baltic trader, which is a sort of 100 foot, 100 year old sailing boat at Falmouth. And on this boat, there was a notice on the shroud saying, return fare paid from Los Angeles. And I had one of these sudden moments of intense conviction. And I sailed away on her into the thin air and had a most extraordinary year, really. There was a crazy German captain who was completely paranoid. He used to walk around the deck naked uh, with his naked girlfriend with us for English crew. And um, he used to shoot his pistol into the sea at Coke Counts to show us who was in command, and he would never let us see the chart, so he never knew where we were. And we went um, across to the Caribbean and stopped at Grenada, went through the Panama Canal and up to Los Angeles. And I, by then, had met Lynn, who has since become my wife, and we've been together for more than 30 years now. And I rang her up from a quay in a harbor in Mexico, Reverse the charges to St. Just, which is, was a good thing to do at that time because the charges never came through, and said, look, we're going to be in Los Angeles in two weeks' time. Will you come and we'll get married in um, Santa Fe or somewhere crazy and have a honeymoon? And she said, no, I can't do that. I'm looking after the children. She had two children uh, of, from her first marriage. I had three and she was carrying our child, Jude, who was born in 1971. And I said, you've al always done what you wanted to do, and put the receiver down. And lo and behold, she was on the quay waiting, and she got her mother very sweetly. And Mary looked after our children, and her mother looked after hers. And it went from there. Actually, we spent a month going around the, uh, Mexico and up to New York, a wonderful, uh, extraordinary time on a Greyhound bus. Lynn's parents, who lived in Gloucestershire, met us at the airport, which was very kind of them. And I remember we were both suffering from jet lag desperately and driving down, very sleepy. And we'd, we'd used all the money we'd got on this trip, and we'd, I had no foreseeable employment. And it was really a strange predicament. Anyway, I said rather casually to Lynn's mother, who had a genius for finding buildings, if you hear of any interesting building in Gloucestershire, I think I'd like to sell up in St. Just and move to Gloucestershire. Anyway, she rang up literally two days later, having found in the small ads of um, the Cheltenham Echo, a barn for sale from the Corpus Christi, who didn't know the value of these things, and it said offers around 10,000. Lynn and I had lots of sort of sleepless nights when we put in. We eventually put in 7,777 pounds. And although we were the underbidder, the bursa at the at Corpus Christi was clueless economically, thought that we were a nice young couple of architects and would do it better than the developer who'd put in 10,000 pounds and let us have it. And so we were there for 10 years, 12 years actually.
And I, I then, because suddenly I couldn't paint with all these children who were growing up and everything, I taught at art school. I went, first I got a job teaching at Harrow for a year when the art master there had a nervous breakdown and I filled in for him. Then I got a job teaching at the foundation course at Hereford Art College, which was something of, of a salvation. And then I was teaching at St. Mary's in the um, Cheltenham College of Art. And so that got us through. And then Lynn started being astonishingly successful as a very, very brilliant interior decorator. So when gets by in these very unpredictable ways. Art teaching is very much in the news just at the moment. I believe one of the new ministers in the education department is very keen on art and design. And I just wonder, what, what are your views on art education? Did you enjoy being a teacher? I have very strong views indeed about art education. I was amazingly fortunate. After being at St. Peter's Loft, I, I had four years at the Slade. And the principal there was William Kelstream. And we had that wonderful ancient slave tradition of real drawing in the life room endlessly, drawing from the antique. Uh, we had to have anatomy classes. We had to have perspective classes, all compulsory. We had um, Professor Gombrich, who was an amazing figure, teaching us art history. And it was just the most brilliant art education one could have had. And then from 1968, when there was the revolution at Hornsey, art teaching just collapsed totally. And all the principals just threw in the towel and just made available studio space. And students just smoked pot and waved their paintbrushes in there and produced rubbish. And to my mind, that's largely gone on since. There was beginning to now go back to, to teaching, drawing and things, which is deeply necessary. It's a very delicate relationship between politics and, uh, and education, isn't it? I'm very, very fortunate because a, great, a person who's become a very great friend from buying pictures of mine in the last few years is Chris Woodhead, who is the um, chief education officer of, in the country. And he is passionate about standards of education. And in fact, he's just recently um, proposed that now he's retiring, he's going to write my biography, which I'm very excited about. Uh, um, but education is something which is profoundly important and which I think has been let slip drastically in the last 30 years at all levels. I was wondering about your own interests. Obviously, you're interested in sailing, is that right? I did a lot of sailing as a teenager. I was sailing in dinghies around St. Michael's Mount a lot. And I, then my uncle also had a wonderful boat called a Scod, which um, he kept up at Milo, uh, which was a little boat with a cabin, which when we had young children, I used to sail a lot. And we sailed across to France. And uh, yes, it's a wonderful sport. Uh, just looking around, I'm, I'm very um, interested to notice how much photography plays a part. The walls here are completely covered in uh, pictures of uh, semi-constructed boats with their ribs and uh, the whole structure of the gunnels uh, exposed and so on. Would you like to tell us a little bit about your interest in photography there? The studio is rather like a, a stage set in a way. And these pictures that are on the wall now... I haven't taken them down because when one's um, rushing to get an exhibition in the wall uh, onto a gallery, um, th this sort of remnant says, oh, oh with next week or the week after, that they'll all come down and one will actually be producing a new scene because this summer I'm going to be painting pictures of the sea. And what I find is wonderful now is I go out with my digital camera, which I adore. Artists have always, since the invention of photography in 1842, art, I mean, Degas and people used photography immediately. And you have to not let 
paintings look like photographs. Some people do this awful thing of just copying photographs, and it's really crap and dull painting. But you can very much use this as an inspiration. And I find what I do is um, take a part of a little digital print and take it out up to the laser printer in Causeway Head, where Val, who works there brilliantly, um, enlarges them up to A3. And you can have these extraordinary images because they begin to be become a sort of an abstraction, but they always hold the subject very strongly. Yes, I, I'm, I'm just very interested. On that side, we've got the, the lovely pictures and so on. And, and looking over here, we've got this most magnificent view over the harbour. And I believe that one of the things that's very much touched you over recent years is, is your general feelings about the development of new linen places. One's very conscious of the proposed marina and things like that. I wonder if you'd like to say a little bit on, on, on how you feel new linen has changed. Yes, I feel passionately about new linen. On the one hand, there's the harbour. On the other hand, there's the art gallery, which we'll perhaps talk about later. And I think, in part... It's rather an extraordinary admission, but my family has been down the tree for 200 years, or a bit more, 200 and, yes, coming up for 210 years now. I think it's partly because I have such long-standing roots. I mean, it's this odd thing of blood being thicker than water or something. And there was a time, and Tim and I can't quite understand how it so much slipped through our collective fingers as a family, when the Le Grouse family owned enormous chunks of Newlyn, including, in fact, this very site here, and Daphne Davis, that lovely farmhouse over there, and a lot done by the gallery and everything, and, and right up the Coombe and up the valley and all, all the country around. And I think it gives one a very keen identifying with the place and um, and that and, and I remember it from my earliest childhood in fact um, Peter Garnier who, who's the husband who's now dead of Pat who owns this property here told me a wonderful story I'm very proud of because he as a young man a teenager um, went down to the post office in Newlyn, and my nanny, who was a very strict martinet of an old-fashioned nanny, had left my twin sister and I in a big pram outside the post office while she was in there, and I'd started crying. And Peter witnessed me, um, her come storming out and saying to me, you won't be a man if you cry. And I, to my astonishment... Peter told me that I'd replied to her, I is a man, which I was <laughs> thought I wasn't <laughs> capable of talking to this terrifying old-fashioned nanny like that. Anyway, that demonstrates a sort of long um, perspective that of my knowledge about the place, and I feel I have a very deep and intense care and knowledge. And it's desperately important how a place like this is developed. Because in contrast to St. Ives and most of the harbours around the coast of Cornwall, or around the coast of England, in fact, or Europe, which have been totally wrecked. I went, for example, to Pont Irvine in Brittany, where Gauguin went. And you know, it's horrendous development uh, and despoilation of the place. And I, as essentially, this is still a working harbour, and there's a nonsensical idea that it should be developed for tourism. And to me, that is anathema, because tourists, when people come down from up country to Cornwall, all they find, in generally, is the same old cliché thing. And miraculously, Newlyn still has a very, very strong identity of a working port with working people living in most of the houses still, and I'm determined, if possible, to help it remain so as long as I possibly can. 
On that same theme, it seems recently that um, art is being used uh, um, as a tool for social regeneration. And, of course, the big example of this has been Project Base and its links with the development of the exchange. Uh, what are your views on that? I also have quite strong views. And I actually, by chance, I'm chairman of the trustees of the Newland Gallery. And I feel very hotly that because the Arts Council has been given very large sums of money to um, the exchange grew up as an extension of New Newland Gallery and has, in a sense, to my mind, usurped Newland Gallery and misused it flagrantly because one of the um, conditions set down by the original benefactors, who in fact included my great-grandfather, said that it was built for the benefit of artists working in the locality. And it's a scandal, to my mind, that because of the Arts Council putting in money, they are now making the conditions that they, they, it should show art, rubbish art, from upcountry, a very cliché-written um, stuff which has no connection with the area. And the artists working around here have been pushed out to other galleries. Yes, I must say, having grown up in St. Ives and seen what's happened to that, you can you can see a pattern over, as you say, over a long period of time. And uh, I suppose we're both looking at it uh, over a fair, fairly long yeah. period of time now. To come back to your paintings again, some of the themes seem quite um, mythological in the sense that uh, we have some black holes looming towards us, like something out of the Odyssey. Is that something which you're conscious of? Yes because I, I'm, I've never wanted to paint in any topographical sense. To me, the meaning of a painting is that it has to ha contain an emotional power. And, for example, there were a couple of moon paintings in that show, and I, I painted a large moon painting, five-by-four-foot moon painting last year, called Menstrual Moon, which was about the power of the moon to influence the tides and women's menstrual cycles and all sorts of things we don't even know about. I, I've got a daughter who's very, very sensitive to um, all these things and she, her mind gets very much changed according to full moons and things like that. And I think those are the sort of areas which interconnect with poetry and literature which painters should be concerned about rather than painting. I get so fed up with sort of decorative, silly paintings about nothing. Have you actually tried painting by moonlight? Because I believe some artists have. Yes, well, famously Van Gogh painted in the dark with candles around his hat. And in fact, there is a painting, I think it's Goya or Blake, of them, a self-portrait, with candles in his hat. And um, I don't know that I've actually tried painting in the darkness. No, I, but I, what I love is when I'm in the studio here and it's very quiet at night and moonlit sea, I painted a series about that. I'm wondering where you're moving on to now because you've had two exhibitions I think in, at, at Bangkok's, the, the first of those last year seemed to be more about the kind of structure of the hulls of boats and the uh, construction and so on. And you mentioned, I believe, that you're moving on to the sea itself. Is that right? Yes, I am currently. The perspective I see in my work from now in the last decade, I, I had... But it started with a wonderful gallery called the North Light Gallery in Huddersfield, which I had a big retrospective about six years ago, together with Michael Finn. And then I had another retrospective at Eton when they um, opened the new art department there with wonderful facilities. And then... I came on from those two important exhibitions to a, another retrospective at the Royal Cornwall Museum, or whatever it's called officially, in Truro, which was about two years ago. 
And then last year, I had three exhibitions. I had a show in London, followed by a quite big show at the Penwith, and then this Bagcock show. And I've got two more lined up in the coming months. So one is kept very busy in one's head. You ask about subject matter, and I say about the sea, but I th quite like not having too definite plans, because what I find is it's terribly important that one work, one's work remains fresh. And if you planned it too carefully, it loses a degree of, well, by definition, it loses spontaneity. Well, this has been a very interesting chat, Jeremy. I'm, I've just had a book um, in to review by, about Henry Scott Tuke by Catherine Wallace. He was very fond of boats and certainly had strong connections with Newlin. Um, I wonder what, uh, what, what you... He was a wonderful painter. I like his paintings immensely. And it's an extraordinary capability that painters have. I, I, I open a page here at random and there's five paintings of full rigged ships. And, and he, when I think of full rigged ships, I think of Duke and the series that he painted in Falmouth Bay. And um, they're very magnificent. And the painter, in a sense, makes an identity of a subject for the people to see subsequently. And there's may, I mean, everyone who looks at a sunset uh, who's ever seen a Turner painting immediately thinks of Turner. He also, besides painting boats, he had this wonderful propensity. He, it's quite well known, I think, that he was one of these closet gay people. And, and there's also all these paintings of boys, which at the time, it, it couldn't be held to be seductive, but they're very sexual paintings indeed, and um, very explicitly so. But thank you very much.